Okay, so hi guys, uh, I'm an ancient Greek reenactor um, and I've been a part of a group uh, that essentially tries to accurately recreate uh, the warriors of the past, ancient Greece, around 6 to 4 centuries BC. Um, so we work with lots of historians, authors um, and universities and we essentially try to accurately recreate and test theories um, of ancient Greek warfare uh, with the kit that's, that's available to us. Um, so, as far as I'm aware, you have covered ancient Greece in this course, right? Yeah. So you know that Greece wasn't a united country, it was a collection of what we call polis, or independent city-states, which functioned differently with their own governments, armies, some extent of language, uh, essentially many countries within Greece, right, you guys have solved yeah. that? So, um, these are called polis, um, or city-states in English, uh, and they obviously, well, there was a lot of them, there's close to a thousand in ancient Greece. Uh, the two most famous being Athens and Sparta, I'm sure you've learned a lot about those. Yeah. Um, and lots of the time, these uh, Greek states warred with each other. So um, we know of large conflicts where they united against the Persians in the 5th century BC, first under King Darius and then Xerxes at the Battle of Marathon, Thermopylae, and Plataea, and a few others. But for most of Greek history, they were fighting each other, um, not enemies, so, or not foreign enemies. Um, so what's interesting with the ancient Greeks uh, is that their military was based on um, citizens. So there was no professional military in any Greek polis or city-state, um, unlike the Romans, which are branching into today, or not today, next week, this week, someone um, who had a professional army. Um, the ancient Greeks uh, were not there. So they were essentially a citizen militia force. So every male citizen from the age of 18 to 60 uh, was um, conscriptable to fight in the army. Now, there's a few exceptions to this, being the Spartans, who we'll touch upon later, who have a lot of misconceptions. Um, but essentially, um, hoplite warfare, hoplite it derives from the Greek term oplite, which means equipment. So it essentially translates to a man who bears arms, is all the hoplite is. Um, and we sort of see the hoplites emerge in the 6th century BC, 7th century BC. Um, and warfare is very different then. So we see what I'm wearing right now is roughly 500 BC, 470 BC, so more what you'd see in the Persian Wars. Which, uh, did you cover the Persian Wars in this class? Uh, yeah, we did. So this is the type of thing that you'd see sort of at the Battle of Thermopylae or, or Marathon. Um, probably a little later than that. Um, but we see a large development in uh, warfare uh, going from more loose, less structured, into full phalanx formations, which we'll see a video later. Uh, this is us in Greece um, in 2022, um, in the Battlefield of Plataea, and a reenactment uh, event. That was a, a week long event um, where we have actually the uh, Vincent, who's teaching us there, he actually teaches it at universities in France. Um, one thing that's really interesting when we come to ancient Greece and lots of other classics in areas of history is that we know very, very little. We know less than we actually know. So what we try and do as reenactors is obviously there's only so many texts that you can study as a, as a scholar, um, but practically testing and practically feeling what things, what, what people at the time would have felt is also a very, very valuable tool in trying to establish what we think worked and what we think happened. So obviously a combination of the two scholars working with practical testers, we call it um, experimental archeology span is sort of the, the, uh, the correct term, I guess, the nerdy term. Um, so we also work with Roll K from Oxford, uh, England. He also helps with some stuff as well. Um, and we essentially try and test and live what scholars put forward as a, as a approach for, for uh, figuring out what these people of the past really did. That's one thing I think that's very important with history is noting that these people were real people, right? They weren't just dates in a history book. They lived a certain way, they fought a certain way, they loved a certain way, they died a certain way. They felt sadness, they felt love, they felt happiness. They were real people, right? They were the same as us. They went through school systems, not too dissimilar to what we have. Um, they had their own issues, they had their own households. You know, these were real people. They weren't just um, figments of a, of a textbook that we read about. And the hoplites especially embody this because they were citizen forces. So most hoplites would have been uh, a baker, a blacksmith, a farmer, who basically had to afford their own kit. So this wasn't conscripted, this wasn't given to you by your government, you'd have to buy what you had. So for me, I'd be quite a, a uh, wealthy individual. I've got leg reeds that protect my legs, I've got a, a bronze muscle crest, I've got a helmet. I'm basically as fully armored as a hoplite in my era would be. Others 
Now this here, this is a, a tube and yoke style armor, or a linear thorax is a common name. That's typically assumed to be a lighter form of armor, less expensive, less protection. Um, some people may not even be able to afford that. So in times of war, Greek warfare was very civil, as if war could be civil. It would mainly be, um, we're fighting for farmland against our neighbors. It's not a conquest war, you know, these are still your neighbors. You don't want to wipe them out. You simply want these fields for your people. You agree to meet on a field that everyone agrees to fight on. Victory conditions are set. You march for a couple of days, set up camp, fight, and march home. It's not really mass extinction conquest that you sort of think about when you think of warfare, especially modern warfare. Um, so casualty rates in Greek battles were quite low um, because at the end of the day, once your formation broke, you'd surrender because you, you were screwed. So these guys, as I said earlier, age 18 to 60, so it's quite a large um, age range. Um, and all, people also seem to think that people died a lot earlier in ancient times. Uh, retirement age is actually later than modern soldier retirement age. Um, of course, the reason that we think people died sooner in ancient Greece was because infant mortality rate was higher, which then lowered the average. So we had more babies dying and more kids dying, but the actual uh, life expectancy of a person is roughly the same as what it is now. So you had elders of states in their 70s and 80s, um, similar to, to today. So as a, as a citizen in my, in my city state, my impressions specifically aimed at Sparta. So I would have been, uh, I don't know if you covered the, the social classes of Sparta, you split into main three classes. You have the Helots who worked as a servant class, you have the Perioikoi who were essentially a working class, and you had the homoioi or the Spartiates at the top, which were the uh, aristocrats, the upper class. I would be an aristocratic member of Spartan society, um, which means I would have gone through the agoge, which was an education system, um, which is commonly believed to be essentially indoctrination into war. It was not necessarily. Um, it seems to more teach you how to be a Spartan, your philosophies and your sort of uh, way of life, um, branching into some physical uh, and military things, but not that much. What separated Sparta from everyone else, which I'm sure you've heard of the Spartans being a very elite military force, yeah. um, was their discipline. So the Spartans were different from the rest of the Greeks because they didn't really work. They were the leisure class, they were elite who ran the estates that the Helots worked on. So they had a lot more leisure time, which allowed them to train more, allowed them to get more exercise, and their military structure was far more similar to that of a Roman legion to the rest of the Greeks. So the Greeks fought in what we call a phalanx, very loosely, which is essentially a wall of overlapping shields. Um, it was a very effective fighting formation. It came in around uh, 600 BC early, um, and it developed and became more and more advanced as warfare went on. We see the, the main aspect of what made a hoplite was the shield. So this is called an aspis, sometimes called a hoplon, but that just means shield. You can see it's a very large shield, um, roughly three feet in diameter, with a weird strapping system. This was essentially what made you a hot, but this is what gave you your strength as a, as a unit. Without this, you would not be able to be a hot player. Um, this protected not just you, but also the people around you. So the phalanx essentially worked with a wall of overlapping shields, usually about seven men deep and sometimes even kilometers long. Um, and essentially, you can see it covers you from about your knee to your neck. So people can see that. And you can imagine thousands of these guys marching up to you with loads of guys behind you, like stabbing you with like a big rolling headshot type thing. Um, so that was essentially how hot fights fought. Very simply, in the prime of hot fight warfare, fifth century BC, you'd make a line in the field, you'd march up to people, you'd meet in the middle, and you'd smash into each other. This is this is one theory that we have <coughs> for the Pismos, which means the great push. Um, I unfortunately am currently restoring another shield, otherwise I, I would have had someone to demonstrate this with me. Um, it's essentially a theory that we have of Greek warfare is that they essentially had a massive rugby scrum pushing match. So you march up to each other with your spears out over the top, you stab at each other and you'd eventually smack into each other and become more of a pushing match, eventually pushing one side over and that's when you'd surrender because once your formation is broken, you'd essentially have no hope in winning, you'd surrender because you don't want to kill all of your people. And at the same time, your enemies don't necessarily want to kill you either. Um, of course, you're still their neighbors at the end of the day, right? Next year, you're going to be trading for something. And lots of these battles occurred uh, annually. 
you know, the same farming fields were desired by both city-states, the same time each year, the same fields, lots of the same battles were sort of being fought. Um, and it was decently civil. Um, we see a, a sort of set rule for victory conditions. Uh, basically, you're conceding of, of accepting, wanting to bring your dead back was sort of you saying, yes, we, we lost the battle. Then one team would build a tropion, which was essentially a scarecrow figure with armor from the enemy. Um, that's where we get the modern term trophy from. So at the turning point of battle where one side fell, the winning side would build a trophy on, which was a, um, a non-permanent victory monument. Uh, again, you didn't want to, to hold it over your neighbors because you were still neighbors. You weren't sworn enemies at the time. Um, and again, that's where we get the, the word trophy from. So the victory point of the battle where you won, trophy on was built, you go home, you clear your dead, you take everything back, and then eventually that trophy on would be disbanded and the fields would be used uh, for whatever you need them for. Um, essentially, the Hoplites were against, were, they were citizens. So for most of their life, they obviously weren't fighting. They were, they were living and working in the cities that they, that they inhabited. Um, and not necessarily everyone would have served in every battle. So you would have seen probably a mix of ages, a mix of uh, a lot of different sort of, some battles need a lot of people, some people you don't. Um, and they would have just been told as a member, as a, as a male in our state, as a citizen, it is your role to serve your, your state in this battle. You'd go, yes, you'd be served. You'd fight your battle and you'd go home and then you go back to what you're doing. But it was, it was very much a, a personal battlefield. You would be next to uncles, fathers, brothers, um, close friends, family, because you were all, um, you all had a duty to serve that city state. And again, the age rate, Age, age range being from 60 to uh, 18 uh, would have seen a large uh, demographic of, of age groups in that battle. Now I'll talk a little bit about the kit now. So as I said, uh, you'd have to buy this kit yourself. So you would see a large disparity of uh, equipped soldiers on the battlefield. You'd see some heavily armored, some lightly armored, uh, some again with the leather thorax, some with the muscle cuirass. Um, different helmets were worn as well. This is sort of the typical Greek helmet called the Corinthian helmet. Uh, you see this a lot in, in sports, mascots, and stuff like that as well. Sort of became the ancient Greek helmet, but it was not the only ancient Greek helmet that was worn. So what I would have to have done is go to blacksmiths to create stuff for me. So all of it had to be made really to fit you, otherwise it wouldn't work. So for instance, the greaves here, they have to be very built to your leg size, otherwise you can imagine they self-clamp, so they're not tied. And if armor, armor doesn't prevent mobility if it's built correctly. So if, as long as this stays on my limb where it's supposed to be, I can move my knee no problem and my ankle no problem. It's, if it's not fitted to you, it slides, you get problems, you can't move it because it, it inhibits a joint. So this would have all been made for me as an individual out of my own expense. So. Some guys wouldn't have been able to afford these. Uh, I did because I'm pretty cool and pretty rich. Um, and essentially, that's how you build up from there. So you could prioritize perhaps uh, these types of armors could be more easily modified. So for instance, um, if my father had stopped serving in the army, I could modify his um, organic cuirass to fit me better. Whereas these things, we see some modifications, but you're limited in the way that it's attached. So. As a, as, a, as a, again, sort of centered around Sparta, um, of the, around 470 BC, I've got a, a bronze muscle cuirass, which was sort of the peak uh, armor that a, a soldier could afford at the time. This, we've tested this practically uh, with multitude of weapons, not this one exactly, but, but, um, but segments of them. And they essentially, you're, you're very safe only if you're wearing those. So um, we've stabbed these with spears, swords, everything. They've gone through maybe a millimeter at the most uh, of a stab. So you're very safe in one of these, uh, but it would also be very expensive. Now, for my helmet here, I've got what's called, again, a Corinthian helmet. Um, you can see that obviously it has a crest and it's very heavily decorated. Um, this was not the only style of helmet that the Hot Whites wore. This was sort of the most closed helmet that they ever wore. Uh, we see sort of an evolution of in the archaic era, the sixth century, more open helmets to when, funnily enough, when they're fighting the Persians, who had a lot more missile fire, they closed it. Um, you can imagine that this obviously protects you more, but is a little bit more uncomfortable to wear. Um, it's hotter, and you can't, you hear yourself very much because the sound travels to your own ear. 
um, and your visibility is limited downwards. Not really forwards, like I can still see Reese over there and I can still see James over there by looking straight. Um, so your peripherals and up, and up isn't really that bad, it's looking down, that's your issue. But we see sort of a change in development as warfare changed to how the equipment changed as well. So we see them start to open up eyes, open up cheeks, open up ear holes as warfare developed to, to accommodate the needs of the warfare at the time. So when we talk about ancient Greece, we sort of think of it as one static time period, right? Instead of realizing that these guys were around for a thousand years, 700 years, and the Sparta in 6th century BC is not the same Sparta in 3rd century BC. So the same way that warfare changed, the same way that style changed, the same way that laws changed. You know, you look at America now and America in the 1960s, you see a big change societally, right? We would see similar changes in the past as well. Just because it's in the past doesn't mean it wasn't evolving and changing then. Um, which is why, again, this is sort of a very set on the 5th century BC, which is sort of where democracy starts to come in, the uh, main philosophies of ancient Greece. So everything starts to originate around the very broad 5th century BC, um, which is where most people are talking about or aim to be talking about when they talk about ancient Greek history. Um, other helmets that you would see uh, would have been different styles. So some of them are completely open-faced. Some of them are essentially just a cone um, called a Pilos helmet, which actually became very popular in Sparta, interestingly enough. Um, and you can see that it's, it's decorated with what's called a crest. So lots of people ask questions um, and assume that crests indicate rank. Um, we have no evidence of crests indicating rank for the Greeks. Um, they seem to be a near universal implement on Greek armor. Um, this is what we call a transverse crest, uh, which seems to be the least common style of crest. Um, others we would have seen front to back, sometimes a cool, uh, tall J uh, shape. Um, they seem to just be personal choice. They seem to be an aesthetics uh, addition, makes you look bigger, intimidating, um, more grand. Um, so no necessarily military purpose that we assume they have, or a lot of people assume they have, unlike the Romans who we do know crest uh, symbolized rank. Lots of the uh, kit, as you can see, is painted. Uh, the shield is obviously a massive aspect that's designed and painted. Um, it's customized by the individual. So even though the hot plates fought in um, very unified and sort of as one, they themselves were very individual because they got to choose essentially what they had. So at events, we get a lot of questions about what we call blazons, which are the designs on the shields. Um, were they religious? Were they standardized? Were they personal? And we can't give you a strict answer for that, um, but it seems there's a lot of variation. So again, as a hot plate, I could choose my own stuff. I could decorate how I want to. Typically, it's how we, it's how we assume it went. So this um, was found on a little shield disc in, in uh, Messenia, which is a territory just outside Sparta, but within Spartan rule. Um, and this it was directly copied, it's currently held in the Sparta Museum. Um, we see stars, which is what this is. Um, some people get a little weird when I say this. This is actually a very, very early swastika. So we know that the swastika was a, was a religious symbol for thousands of years before the Nazis got hold of it in World War II. The Greeks were no different from that. The Greeks, the Hindis, they all had swastikas in art. This solar symbol is in that same family. So it has no correlation to the Nazi swastika, but it, the solar symbol, that's what, it, that's what one of the, the swastikas is, is a solar symbol. That's commonly associated with Apollo, uh, the god of the sky, right, the god of the sun. Um, so it's possible that this means that I would be dedicating myself to the god Apollo if I painted a, a star on my shield. Um, Athena associated with the owl, it's possible you paint an owl on your shield for Athena to favor you. Um, we see some, again, religious connotations, the eagle for Zeus, the boar for, for Ares, or uh, it could also be a personal choice. So we have writings of a Spartan who decided to paint a life-size fly on his shield um, because he apparently wanted to get so close to his enemy that a fly appeared to them as a lion. Um, and we also see some standardized shields as well. So I'm sure you've seen the image of the Spartans with the upside down V, the lambda, the Greek letter L on their shield. Um, and the Thebans with the, with the Club of Heracles or the Club of Hercules as well. We have very little evidence for the Spartans using the lambda, but it seems that it possibly came in later on during the Peloponnesian Wars. Um, of course, during the Peloponnesian Wars, it was a massive, massive era of, of conflict. 
uh, which means you have to conscript more men to fight, which would then indicate that the L, the Lambda, which stood for Laconia, which was the region that Sparta was located, Sparta was the capital city of Laconia, which was one of the largest regions uh, in Greece, would have been issued to helots or um, poor people who couldn't actually afford their own shields. So your property of Laconia, there's your Laconian shield. Um, we know the sacred band of Thebes supposedly had the cob of Heracles, um, but again, we see a lot of leeway in the design of these shields. So some of them were personal, some of them were religious, some of them could have been state issued, and you would have seen a large variety on the battlefield. Same with colors. My, my impression here is very focused on red. Um, you would have seen colors going from red to turquoise to white to black to yellow to orange. They were very, very fond of their colors which is something that we, um, as modern people, looking back at ruins, don't really appreciate. So we look at the Parthenon now, the most famous building in Athens, um, we see white marble, we see statues as, as being white. But actually back in the day, those would have been highly painted. And the Greeks, and most, most of human history, actually absolutely loved colors, and it was reflected in the stuff that they wear as well. So when we look at vase images, which is one of the uh, key sources of information you have for looking at Greek history, they only have about three or four colors that they can depict on the vase because it has to be baked. Um, so essentially, we see red, white, black, um, and beige are the only colors that we can really see. So you can imagine it would be like looking back um, on us in only black and white movies. It would be sort of a, um, an assumption that you can make is if, imagine that in 2000 years from now, the only evidence that they have of our civilization is black and white film. So we're sort of limited that way as well. We know the, the sort of scale of the colors, the, um, the tonal values, but we're limited in actually the depictions in those colors, but we know they have pigmentation um, of other colors as well. Does that, does that make sense to me? Yeah, what I mean there? Yes. The black and white movies can show us the um, sort of tonal values, but you don't know if it's a black, a blue, or a dark red the same way that on a vase you might find that the black depicted isn't actually black, it could be just a darker tonal value. So that's one thing um, that we see a lot and we experiment a lot with. Uh, and the Met Museum, the Metropolitan Museum of Art in New York, actually did a restorative project where they repainted ancient Greek statues with pigmentation that they traced on the statue. And we see a lot of yellows, greens, blues, reds, oranges. We see a lot of vibrant colors. So it's possible that that was also reflected in what the hoplites would have worn in that time as well. So uh, that's sort of the overlook of the hoplite, what he is, a citizen militia soldier who had to serve in the army at certain points in his life. Um, I can't really demo this for you right now, but this is essentially... Um, so the Spartans got their military power through essentially uh, having a far more structured force. Um, so they had what were called morai or lokoi, which essentially were regiments. So they had a very strict command structure. Um, you would have had the polemakoi, who was the head of that, that was a, a couple thousand men per, per morai. And they had a command structure where they'd been passed down, passed down, passed down. And essentially in every file in their phalanx, in every row, there was one commanding officer. So you can imagine that their um, orders and their, their, their actions could be passed down to everyone far quicker because at every point you could see a commanding officer. Whereas you may find in lots of other phalanxes, there was maybe one commanding officer per 50 or per 100 um, guys. Um, what, how the Spartans excelled was actually their maneuverability. So um, phalanx warfare, there's only really so much to it, right? You march, you stab, you push. What the Spartans could do far better than anyone else was, was move the phalanx. So the phalanx is a very difficult thing, as you can imagine, if you have relatively untrained people, which the hot plates were. They were relatively untrained. They were quite proud to be untrained people. Um, they weren't professional soldiers, and they sort of prided themselves on that. Um, you could be very limited in how much you could do in a, in a combat situation. Uh, how the Spartans won lots of battles is they would wheel. So you'd have two phalanxes march up to each other, and at the last minute they'd do that to flank. The other phalanx would break trying to counter that, because it was a very difficult uh, action to do. And once your formation broke, you were kind of screwed. So, uh, the Spartans weren't an unstoppable fighting force. They had many tragic defeats, uh, the biggest at Leucatra, where they sort of lost their dominance after the Peloponnesian Wars with the Thebans, um, and also Spacteria and a few others, but they, they were the most elite force in Greece. But what's important to note about that, that doesn't mean that the whole Spartan military was. So I don't know how much you covered about Sparta, but essentially, as I mentioned earlier, there were three main social classes, right? The Helots, Periodia, and Homoioi. 
only the Homoyoi would have been the elite Spartans uh, of the day, not anyone else in the army. So the Spartans also brought Perioi to fight their sort of working servant class, who would have essentially been the same um, as any, any other hot fight uh, in any other city state. So when we look at phalanxes, the formations, you would see a long, a, typically a row of people, about seven men deep and hundreds of thousands long. The typical formation that you would do, this is if a phalanx is facing this way, um, your most elite force would take up the right. Your sort of, this is the position of honor. This is where you station your best people. And typically it would go down from there. Now this has a tendency to make um, formations sort of spin. So typically when you'd move forward, you'd end up doing something like that. Uh, but the other battle, the other battle line would do the same thing. Um, so what this does is if a man has two phalanxes clashing against each other, it means that the elite of each force are separate. You have, you have elite versus weak, and you have elite versus weak. And that essentially would make you spin. Um, so the Spartans at Plataea, we know that they took the right flank, uh, the Athenians took the left, and the... Uh, I forget which other force is in the middle. Some other, other Greeks anyways. Um, and we know that the, the Thebans were actually fighting the Athenians um, as well. But uh, this wouldn't be always the case. So we see, for instance, at the Battle of Leucatra, um, they did a very interesting thing, the, the Theban general, where he actually completely changed their length warfare. And the Spartans took up their very um, typical, uh, this sort of formation, and what the Thebans actually did um, was, I'm going to draw it to the side, he had a 50 man deep phalanx and two smaller or three smaller sections. And you can imagine, and he also sorry, positioned his elite on the left side, which meant it was elite versus elite. So that massive force of people smashed into the Spartan phalanx and essentially pushed them over. So you see that we see lots of changes in Greek warfare. It wasn't one static sort of thing, um, but that was sort of fundamentally how it worked. Overlapping shield walls, overlapping spears, war march forward, you smash. Now, interesting enough, I couldn't bring a sword today because of, I'm assuming a sword wouldn't let me do that. Um, you would have had a side arm as well, uh, a sword. You would have had roughly an eight foot spear, which was double ended. Um, that did a couple of things. Uh, one of the reasons that it was double ended is likely to counterweight your spear. So the, the bronze end was heavier, which means you could hold it further back than forward. So uh, I guess I could demo this. Um, but one of the most, it was called a sorato, which translates to lizard sticker in, in English. Um, and that meant because it was bronze, you could stick it in the ground and wouldn't corrode, you could walk off and leave it. But with a counterweighted spear, it means that you can hold the spear further back and it doesn't drop. Um, so that was one of the things is obviously you can get more reach with that than if it wasn't counterweight, you sort of have to hold it in the middle. Um, but after that... Um, was it common to like jab your buddy behind you by accident? Um, we yeah. have never encountered that um, because it's held up. you sort of this. Well, I was wondering if French had to look up and see what's happening. Uh, don't do that. Um, and essentially, we from the, the office boss, people often ask, this sword <laughs> obviously doesn't look particularly big. It doesn't need to be. So you can imagine if someone's, uh, if you're smashed into someone like this, pushing, you want a short sword. You want to get through eye holes, neck holes, and stuff like that. So it was quite brutal, but you went from having very, very long spears to very, very short swords. Um, typically, the Spartans actually developed an even shorter sword, uh, which is what this one would be, like. well, maybe didn't develop, but, but used uh, more so than anyone else. Um, would anyone like to try on some of the stuff? So. This is a slightly less uh, protective, but still, this was actually the most common armor that we saw in the group world. Okay. How much protection was there <coughs> before do you compare to the one that you I don't know, but I'll still win. How much compared protection to the Protection compared to the muscle curves? Yeah. Um, we don't actually know how these were made necessarily. So this is a, a layered linen approach. Yep. Um, others we have theories of, of actually uh, 
quilted or unglued or like leather and sometimes we would have seen scales uh, but we're actually very much left in the dark as to how these were made there we go, time's following it. Um, let's go on. The left arm will go through this. And you can have the, the left side of the that way. Grab that thing. Oh my god. So that's going to go on your head. As long as your brain is not too big. Why don't they have that? I've got a picture. What's the problem now? Just push it on. There we go. <laughs> So um, the question is there as to how it, how it, the protection boundary differs. Yes. Um, spheres will get through that. Um, it obviously is better than nothing, and that's a compromise that we see a lot with with wool <laughs> Is um, if you're going to hit the chest, you're in trouble anyways. Um, but of course, lots of it is what's going to protect me more. What's going to be better than nothing? Let's go, Miss Yeah, don't we? Are you really feeling that class? <laughs> So um, that's the compromise you see a lot is, of course, it's, this may not uh, save me, but it's going to protect me more. And that's the other thing. You have to remember, on a, in a battlefield situation, um, there's a lot more threats than just the guy you're fighting. There's splintering arrowheads, there's splintering spears, there's rocks. Yes. So this armor doesn't just have to protect you from blades, it has to protect you from incoming it, everything. Yeah. And you can imagine that with, I'd rather get stabbed wearing that than not. For sure. So even if it means that you know you're wounded, it's the difference between being impaled and, and just cut. So it's not impenetrable. Even this isn't impenetrable. Um, it's more impenetrable than that. Um, and but same with the shields. The shields also weren't designed to. I guess I can cover that as well. Do you want to get out of the stuff you still want to? So this is made from a, from a the Vatican shield, uh, which is an archaeological example. Um, in the Vatican Museum. Nice. Uh, now, interesting enough, this is cooler than this. So the metal sort of acts as a conductor. It it takes the heat out of you, and it's hot, but you're not. Whereas this, you can imagine, it is essentially a linen corset. So once you once it heats up, you're stuck in the, in the heat. But the battles didn't last very long. So you actually wouldn't be wearing armor for a particularly long time. Uh, Josh, you also wanted to wear it. Oh, um, yeah, and, and people want to. <laughs> so, yeah. This helmet's big, that's why I bought it, is because people that have bigger heads than me might actually be able to wear it. Oh, sweet. <laughs> I'm going to go beat up my head. <laughs> Maybe not. Is it? Um, so, so shields were actually they were made of, of wood predominantly. So, it's look at infant, my head's too heavy. This is uh, it's just, it's strips of wood sandwiched with layers of linen. Um, sometimes you could have coated it in bronze if you would have the, the funds to do so. Um, and this wasn't designed to just be impenetrable either. You can actually imagine um, if your weapon gets stuck in the shield, you're in bigger trouble than the person whose shield the weapon stuck in. So when we do our individual fighting, which maybe I can get one of those for you, so yeah, I'll sure. show you. So some of our stuff that we do is more of a dueling. So even if you're hit, you're not dead, right? So lots of the hits that we traded on each other there would not have eliminated you from the from the battle. You know, if I got a gouge in my thigh, I would have kept going. He got stabbed in the foot, he could have kept going. So lots of the areas that you sort of have covered um, are the vital areas. So, and it's very difficult. You could, like, we're sort of poking around there, trying to get us, and there was only really one kill shot out of that whole engage. So, it was hard to kill people, um, which is which is good, really. You know, you didn't need to necessarily kill people to win a battle that you're talking about. Um, and in in typical hoplite -like warfare, um, did anyone else want to wear any of the stuff? Yeah, you could even try and hold the shield. <laughs> Charlie wants to wear it. Huh? I'm good. Yes, Charlie. So I mean, I guess I can move up the shield a little bit. So the inside of the shield is a weird design. So you can see that there's like a, a strapping system mixed with the with the four packs of center on there. There's also a weird rope that goes around. Um, we don't really know what that's for, but what this allows us to do. This is actually slightly off-center. I don't know if people can see that. The armband is slightly off-center. 
that puts my elbow in the middle of the shield, which is the more um, control, but it also creates a larger overlap. So you can imagine that in a formation, I have more of my shield overlapping the guy next to me. We don't see that on every shield, the off-center armband, but we do see that on quite a lot. Um, and that was also likely developed as the phalanx sort of got more and more uh, constructed. Now I'm just keeping an eye on the time. How much time have I got? Oh my God. 20 15. minutes. I have 20 minutes? It's 15. 15. Never mind. That's sort of all I wanted to talk about, mainly the gist of everything. So. Does anybody have questions? Will we be able to open up if you're yeah, yeah, game absolutely. for that? I know Bianca has one over there, and if yeah. anybody else. So, in the beginning of the presentation, I remember this one was really good, but um, you were talking about like the push and stuff, mm -hmm. and I remember at the talent show, you did some sort of the dance. Was that kind of taking inspiration yes. from that? Yes. So, so that's that what we call a pyrrhic dance. That was one of the only areas of training that we know hot legs did. Um, so, that's the whole goal of that sort of fight was to. to do a demo of what you'd do in a battlefield situation. Oh so you march up to each other, you poke each other, and eventually at the end of that dance battle, maybe you can slash into each other. That would have been an example of the LP spots. Yeah, first push. Um, it, was, it was more of an entertainment thing. So it was, it was a way of producing an, an art with your community, but also training in, in a way as well. Okay. Yeah. And also, you said like it has to be. All the equipment has to be like formed to your body and your measurements and stuff. So did you have to get everything custom made, or were you able to get it like Look, this stuff. Yeah. Um, custom. Yeah, basically. So lot, lots of I make. Like I make the shields, the clothing, stuff like that. This was made by a guy in Toronto. I was doing the kind of sort of pre pre art, which is company. These I was looking up. These are actually second hand, custom made from another from another reenactor, but um, they fit my legs, so I managed to get those. So yeah, basically. Um, you can get away with unfitted stuff, it's just fitting is really important. Otherwise, like, imagine if this was too big for me to grapple around and, and my mobility would be stuck. Like, I have pretty good mobility with this, I can get on the floor and get up and things like that. That's the thing, is people will also think that arms are heavy and some do down. Everything that I wear is about 24 pounds. Yeah. But remember that that's also spreading up the whole body. So, this cuirass is sitting on my waist, it's sitting on my hips, and sitting on my shoulders. So I'm heavier, but it doesn't, necess that doesn't necessarily feel like it's on my shoulders. But I can imagine that's heavier than that. That is actually slightly lighter. Oh, okay. So um, I think this is 13 pounds, that's about 10. Okay. Um, but then some of those you could get scale stitching on that. So those could be heavier than, than these as well. Um, but yeah, you'd see like a lot of variety. Right, you know, and, and you see some helmets, of course, if you have more. So you can see some helmets could be passed down from grandfather to father to son, type things. Um, and that's another thing, it's always shields, it could have been a herald so it could have been a family crest, possibly as well. But lots of it with the Greeks, um, different from like medieval era, is um, they have a lot of manuscripts or actual instructions, just this is how you wield a long sword. We don't have any of that in the country Greek Greeks. So lots of it, and this is why reenactment and experimental archaeology is really important, is lots of it's done by using authentically sourced gear. This is what we feel works the best. Which working with sources is sort of a way, this is likely a way that they do things. Um, and we don't just do combat um, as well, we do like, we uh, try and live and eat the same food they ate for the time we're at as well. So it is really like the time travel experience. Um, and lots of our events are public. So MTA, which is where that was, that was in Virginia. It was the largest um, timeline event uh, in America. Saw uh, 5,000 visitors a day, and it went from ancient Greece to Vietnam, mm -hmm. the eras of, of history. So we see lots of events like that. The Greek events, there's another one this summer actually. Um, it's like a week long event in Greece on the real map. That's what we talked about. Um, but yeah, so so yeah, to answer your question, it would have been yeah, a bit different. Yes. Do you pay for those calendar events? No, they're all volunteer events. Oh. Um, if you, uh, as a visitor, you have to pay, but as a reenactor, no. Any other, any other questions about any of the gear or any of the, something like that? No, thank you. Gave a very good overview of the different types of gear and stuff. Yeah. Yeah. Combat and stuff, but it's nice to like. This means more, right? When yeah. you can visualize it. Yeah. I yeah. Agree. yeah. What's the, the <coughs> 
this thing. Yeah. This is what holds my sword. So I want I can't bring a sword. A lot of the weapons that we actually use are real. So I bought in a, a dummy spear, which is what we use for sparring. <coughs> Otherwise everything else we use is actually real. I can't bring that into a school. So I would have had a sword here. That's what this thing is. Awesome. Would you be okay if people just want to even like get up and just kind of look at stuff? Yeah, yeah, I mean I can the equipment and stuff that you brought. Get us have a class in here next period. He does, yeah. We've got five minutes in. Five minutes.